Welcome back. You're still watching The Globe. Environmental activist group Greenpeace has uncovered widespread use of illegal drift nets in the northwest Indian Ocean, which it says are decimating marine life in what is one of the world's most ecologically vulnerable fishing grounds. During two weeks at sea, the environmental organization says it filmed seven ships within 20 square miles using drift nets to catch tuna and detected another eight vessels on radar that also suggested use of nets. The group shared video footage that showed sharks and manta rays that had been killed in nets set some 500 miles east of Somalia. These nets are nicknamed the Wall of Death for the quantity of other sea life they catch in addition to the fish they are set for. They were banned by the United Nations 30 years ago. This is Greenpeace UK Head of Oceans, Will McCallum. As we arrived, though, what we weren't prepared for was just how many we'd actually be able to see at night. The reason is because they've got these football stadium lights that they shine on the, onto the water that attract the squid. So they're fishing at this unbelievable scale, and it's really surprising how little we know about just how they're doing this fishing. He added that enforcement of the UN ban is needed in international waters to resolve an enormous governance gap. Nations are due to meet in August for negotiations over a global ocean treaty designed to set up safeguards for parts of the ocean. Well, let's talk to Will McCullum now. He's the head of oceans at Greenpeace UK and he joins us now via Zoom from London. Well, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, that's quite a sobering story that uh, we've just seen there. You spent, um, what, two weeks on the oceans there on a reconnaissance mission. What did you find? We were out at sea for, for a few weeks in the Northern Indian Ocean at the start of this year. And I suppose the most shocking thing in the time that I was there was that every single boat that we came across was either illegal or unregulated. What we were documenting were these two different fleets. One was the illegal drift net fleet that were catching tuna, and one was a squid fleet, which is these huge boats shining football stadium lights onto the ocean, which are often over 70, 80 meters are entirely unregulated. The fact that none of the boats that we saw are following any kind of rules is what's really terrifying. Now, the Indian Ocean, it's utterly vital for the food security of countries. Uh, across the Indian Ocean. So when you start impacting fish stocks in that way, the consequences could be really dire. Mm. These nets, these uh, called walls of death, banned 30 years ago, how is it that they're still able to operate then? It's a good question. It's really shocking that they are around. You always expect, you know, the odd boat, the odd, uh, the odd bad egg to, to, to be using illegal fishing methods. What we saw was that every single one of these boats was using nets of 10 kilometers or more long. That's more than four times the regulation size. And in these nets, which hang 10 meters deep in the water, they're left there overnight, there was all kinds of marine life. These nets shouldn't even be leaving port. There should be inspections in the countries that they're leaving from to make sure they're not taking this illegal gear out to the ocean. Mm. And then out on the ocean, we need more enforcement. We need all governments that are members of the fisheries management organizations to be putting in place proper enforcement. Are they moving towards that kind of agreement and enforcement? I hope so. So this year, we were meant to see the conclusion of a global ocean treaty. Now, the pandemic has delayed negotiations, possibly until this August, maybe later. And we hope that in those negotiations, we'll see governments come together to realize that the current rules are just not working for mm. international waters. Right now, we are not seeing fisheries being managed well. We're also not seeing any kind of measures for conservation. Over the course of 2019 and 2020 and 2021, we've just seen over and over again, regional fisheries management organizations failing to take ambitious action. So what we hope is that in the coming year, governments will come together, agree a strong global ocean treaty that puts in place proper rules, proper collaboration to stop this kind of thing from happening in the future. It does seem that um, if they succeed in this, um, a lot of illegal operators will lose a lot of money. And so there must be a lot of people working very hard to make sure that this never happens. 
That might be the case, but the one way to make sure that fishing communities and fishers from across the world have more money, have livelihoods in the future, is to make sure there are enough fish there. Mm. And the best way we can do that is to enforce these rules properly now so that fishing communities can survive and have a future ahead of them. We live in a world where the source of uh, products, source of food, is getting better and better documented. I'll go to the shops tomorrow and I'm going to see tuna on the shelves there. And I just wonder if we as consumers have any idea how this fish is being fished. It's always good when you're buying fish, no matter where it's from, to ask the question, how is it being caught? Who has it been fished by? Wherever you can, make sure you're buying it from local fishing communities, from people using passive gear. That's uh, gear that's not hauled through the water by enormous boats, but hole and line, traps, that kind of thing. More and more, we're saying to people who can afford to choose, try to eat a bit less fish. You know, don't have it for every meal, don't have it every single week. Try to eat continually reduced, because the only way we're going to protect the oceans and keep them healthy for future generations is if globally we bring down the amount of fish we're eating and make sure the fish that we are eating is caught more sustainably. So you saw all these boats uh, uh, on, at sea uh, fishing illegally. They must belong to someone and come from certain countries. Do we have any idea about the identity of these, I'll call them pirates? Uh, I wouldn't go so far as pirates, <laughs> but certainly boats acting in, uh, in, in bad faith. Yeah, we can, we can name the countries that these boats are from. So in the Indian Ocean, the, the, the vessels that we saw fishing illegally were predominantly from Iran. The, special, the vessels that we saw that were unregulated were predominantly from China. However, we also saw the enormous industrial ships from France and Spain, which may be operating within the letter of the law, but are certainly responsible for a large amount of overfishing in the Indian Ocean as well. All right, so you're suggesting that the laws perhaps are not as good as they ought to be? Absolutely. The laws have been created by countries with a vested interest in making sure they can extract as much as they can. So we need to see not just the issue of illegal fishing ta uh, taken on, but also the issue of mm. legalized overfishing. So a global ocean treaty is one of the ways that governments can do this, agreeing a strong treaty that puts conservation at the heart of ocean governance, but also making sure that, that in this June's meeting of the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, all of the commission members, all, the, all of the countries that make up that membership agree ambitious catch limits for the amount of tuna in the Indian Ocean. All right. So just describe again uh, the effects of using these massive nets, these drag nets. Uh, they catch everything, sadly, not just the fish that they're looking for. Yeah, when I was out there, what we saw was uh, nets roughly seven miles long being laid out. They're laid wow. overnight, and when they're in the water, they're hanging about 10 meters deep. So they're really catching absolutely everything that is uh, coming their way. So as they were hauled out, a process that takes many hours to haul a net that long out, we saw melon-headed whales, we saw spinner dolphins, we saw thresher sharks, we saw a number of endangered devil rays, as well as a vast amount of tuna. So it's a, it's a pretty scary thing to watch, knowing as we do that fish stocks in the Indian Ocean are collapsing. We are seeing overfishing at a terrifying scale, and we know that economies across the Indian Ocean are so dependent on that fishery. And so to see this illegal activity coupled with the enormous industrial votes that we saw from Spain, it was really a, a scary thing to witness. If nothing is done, how soon might there be no fish to fish? The scary thing with uh, fish populations and how they work is it's not a gradual decline. You get to a cliff edge. So we don't exactly know when that cliff edge will be, when fish numbers will suddenly off. But it could be at any time, particularly given climate change and the impacts of climate change are getting worse and worse in the ocean. Mm. We're seeing more marine heat waves. We're seeing more extreme weather events. Now, how that relates to overfishing is very complicated. So putting predictions of single dates, you know, it's not worth the paper it's written on. But what we can say is that the general trend is a very bad one, and we need governments to take urgent action right now. 
how, how does one decide what level is overfishing then? I mean, <laughs> it seems as if this is a moving target. We have a global population that is increasing at a rate, demanding more food. Otherwise, they wouldn't fish as much as they do because they're able to sell everything that they, that they fish. So we have groups of scientists around the world trying to do exactly this. And the scientific advice that they gave to the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission was to reduce catches by 20%. Now, that advice has not been listened to by governments. Now, we can quibble over uh, the exact percentage, but broadly, scientists are agreeing that we need ambitious cuts and we need them quickly. And yet governments are refusing to listen to that because they're listening more to voices from the fishing industry who are saying, we need to keep the status quo. So whilst we might not be able to put exact numbers, what we can say is that fisheries should be managed in a precautionary way. Mm. That means taking action now to avoid more drastic action in the future. So if uh, we do reduce the catch sizes, is that not going to put pressure on prices for the consumer? It shouldn't do. Now, we know that a lot of this fish is being transshipped out of the region, taken out of the region and processed and then sold extremely cheaply right away across the world. Now, uh, the consumer needs to worry about having fish that is sustainably priced for a long time into the future. If fish stocks start to collapse, then the prices will rocket. So it's much better to take small, st smaller steps, relatively smaller steps now to make sure that fish remains an affordable protein for the majority of people. All right. So this, the area that you were in is uh, Northwest Indian Ocean. Is this something that might be happening around the world uh, in your estimation? Absolutely. We've seen the uh, International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuners also failing to implement uh, uh, ambitious measures. We've seen the South Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Organization failing to take ambitious action. So the Indian Ocean is not alone. We're seeing across the world regional fisheries bodies are not listening to the science. They're not cutting catches. And as a result, they're putting in danger fishing economies around the world. And they're also putting in danger the incredible wildlife in the ocean. All right. What can we do as citizens to force our governments and force the, uh, the UN to get their act together? Good question. What we need people to do is to raise their voices. Now, we have seen a huge interest in the ocean from politicians across the spectrum, across the world in the last mm. few years. And we need to maintain that momentum. So writing to your politicians, tweeting them, posting on Facebook, whatever it is, mm. getting them to say, yes, we will protect the ocean. We will put large areas of the ocean off limits to the fishing industry so that it can recover and thrive. And we will manage the fishing industry sustainably. So, you know, put your message to your politicians use your voice, sign petitions, it all really helps to make that case that protecting the oceans now is what will keep them healthy for future generations. Well, McCullum, thanks very much indeed uh, for joining us and uh, uh, telling this uh, very sad story. And let's just hope the more we talk about it, uh, that um, the, uh, it puts pressure on the, the various authorities to do something. Thanks so much indeed for, for uh, sharing your time with us this evening.